So today's readings from Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Uh, then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You, do not, uh, you did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he eternally warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now let us confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Quiet. Well, grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great text, right? Yeah. Matthew 16, all right? And this is pretty unusual. Jesus doesn't usually ask people's opinions, does he? You never see him doing that. So he gets, you know, he when he does something, it's always for a reason, right? I've always said this, and you see it in Scripture, that any time that God asks a question, He already knows the answer. Right? But He is doing this for a reason. And so He looks at His disciples when they're in Caesarea Philippi. And I, I may mention this, I want to do this. Caesarea Philippi is a very interesting place. You remember how Philippi itself... All those soldiers retired when we were studying the, the book of Philippians. They retired over there, all of them. Well, this was also a retirement place for some of them. There was a lot of different idols there and stuff that was in Caesarea Philippi. I went to this where Gentiles were. You know, Jesus kind of visiting the, the Gentiles. In fact, there was a cave there that used to have smoke that would blow out of it. They, they say that led to Hades. It was very interesting when you look at the context of this, that the, the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades, will not prevail, right? It's actually said in a place that they might understand that. Just a little bit of background. That's interesting, isn't it? So he says to them, you've been out preaching, going different places, they've been out two by two, casting out devils, healing the sick, cleansing the leper, getting run out of town to town sometimes, right? Some people like them and they stay there, and he says, so when you're going around talking to everybody, who do they say that I am? And they begin to talk about how he's like the different prophets and Jeremiah and all these others and Ezekiel. And some even one time they said, well, maybe John the Baptist back from the dead, you know. But this is a good question. Who do men say that I am? And then an even better question is, as he turns around and looks at his disciples who weren't quite as talkative after this question, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that, that I am? Good question. Many times of people throughout the ages have asked, who is Jesus? As most of you know, in our society the way it is, a very pluralistic society, you could talk about God all day long. But as soon as you mention that Jesus is God, well, it gets turned around really quick, doesn't it? 
But who is Jesus? I mean, when he entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred in Matthew 21 and 10 when he came in on that donkey that time and they said, who is this? Who is this guy? And maybe you're asking the same question honestly today. You've heard about the historical Jesus, but who is he to you? You've heard people talk about who he is. Just like, who do men say that I am? Maybe you've studied something. Maybe you've studied some history. Maybe you've looked at it to yourself. Maybe you've looked at the historical Jesus. There's all kind of blatant, blasphemous films out there to try to describe who Jesus is, really blow the history on it. But who is Jesus to you? Maybe you're asking that question. And I believe I have an answer for you. Hopefully that you'll see who he is. Now, I like Peter. Everybody like Peter? You know why I like Peter? Because he's like me. Right? If there's anybody we can relate to, it's Peter, right? Because the guy, sometimes he really got it right, and other times, man, he would just blow it, right? The other ones actually were the same way. They just learned to keep their mouths shut. But Peter just couldn't help it, all right? But Jesus loved Peter. And when he was asked, who do you say that I am? He spoke up right away. He said, you're the Christ. And by the way, Jesus' last name isn't Christ, okay? It's not. That's describing who he is. Everybody said, Jesus, that's not his last name. Christ means the anointed one in Greek. In, in, in uh, Hebrew, it's Mashiach or Messiah. It means, it's the same thing, anointed one. You know how you get, if I took some oil from here and I, where is it? Oh, here. Get some of that oil and I anointed you with oil. You know, here in Lutheran Church, they give you a little dab, you know. Some of the other churches, man, some churches, when you got prayed for, they, man, they give you the oil, all right. You want to be anointed, you got anointed, all right. And then pour it down. They, they, that's, what, that's anointed, right. When you call the anointed one the Christ, he was anointed for a particular purpose as Christ. He was the Messiah. He was called to come to do something. In Hebrew, Mashiach, or Messiah, means to smear, right? Like the oil, meant to smear. And I always think that's interesting that Jesus was the smeared one. He was smeared. Remember when somebody's reputation is smeared? Jesus was smeared for me and for you. He took your reputation. He took the smearing. He took your, your rap sheet. He took your record on himself. Jesus, which means Yahashua, God our Savior, the Anointed One, to do what? To take your record, to take your crimes, to take your sin, to take your place. So when Peter looked at him and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus got excited. He said, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. Now, we have to correct something here right away. Because we are Lutherans. And what do you mean? Jesus was not making Peter the first pope. <laughs> That's not what he was doing. All right? He was telling him that upon what you are saying, and this understanding, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's what I'm going to build my church on. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now it's interesting, it's not that the hell's trying to break in. Everybody gets that wrong. It's the church is breaking into hell. And it's not going to prevail against us. We're here to take names, man. We're here to break through the gates of hell. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus is the only one true foundation. That no other foundation is laid except that of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He was the stone that the builders rejected. I have some people that smoke weed that are afraid to come to church. I told them I was almost going to start a church for them called the Stoners that the builders rejected. <laughs> but we're not like that around here. You just come. You hear me? Nobody's going to say anything to you. Amen. Except you're forgiven. God loves you. Praise God. 
right? Oh, you people, you just say, yeah, we believe it, man. We believe it, right? But that's a commercial. That's a good one, right? But upon this rock will I build my church. Jesus Christ is the foundation. See, great, I love, can I quote Augustine as we talked about him today? Boy, we had a great time with that in, in Education Hour. This is what he said. Christ, you see, built his church not on a man, but on Peter's confession. What is Peter's confession? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's the rock for you. There's the foundation. There's where the church has been built, which the gates of the underworld cannot conquer. Said Augustine. Isn't that great? That's the church is built on Jesus, on who Jesus is, on what he has done, what he does for his people, not on what we do for him. What's a sure foundation? That's a strong, solid base which cannot be moved or destroyed. Jesus said, A person that hears my sayings and does them is like someone who builds his house on a rock. Right? And Marco and Laura come, and it doesn't matter. They blow, but they can't level the house because it is built on a rock. Right? But people who hear his word and don't do it is like people that build their house on the sand. Now, me and my brother are twins. I have an identical twin brother. So we used to sing that song, Don't build your house upon the sandy land. Don't build it too near the shore. It, it might be kind of nice, but you'll have to build it twice. <laughs> you'll have to build your house once more. So build your house on a rock, on a firm foundation, on a solid spot. Though the storms around you blow, yet the peace of God you'll know. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Sounds really cool in stereo with your twin. <laughs> right. No, if he's down here, we will do it. We are very crazy together, right? It's a strong, solid base that can't be moved. A sure foundation that will support whatever rests on it. When we construct a building, for example, we are careful to make the foundation as strong as possible so the building will endure. In the same way, we must build our lives. Or actually, Jesus does it for us. He builds our lives on his life. His death, His burial, His resurrection, right? So that we can endure the trials of this life looking forward to eternal life. Our Savior Jesus is the only sure foundation on which a life can be built. During this time we didn't sing it. I really like the old hymn. The church, the church is one foundation. Is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is His new creation by water and the Word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Isn't that great? 1 Corinthians 3 and 11 says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. We do not build our lives on a Roman Catholic system. Can I say we love everybody, but I'm just preaching right now, right? I don't build my life on the Pope. I don't build my life on a works-based idea that I'm doing something to earn my way into heaven. There's no money I can pay to get into heaven. There's no deed I can do to get into heaven. For the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Yes. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Our foundation is built on Jesus. Well, who is Jesus? Well, one man said, Jesus is God with the skin on. <laughs> I like that, right? My friend Salim, who always argues with me, he's, he's, this, he's from Islam. I love him. He's, he's Muslim. I talk to anybody. We sit down, we talk and everything. His, he makes the best Lebanese food. Oh, good. And Turkish coffee. You want to be with Salim. I don't care what he believes. That stuff's good, all right? <laughs> but we always argue theology, and he knows that he's going to say something to me. And I, I said, and Jesus is the Son of God. No, he isn't. I said, yes, he is. 45 times the New Testament says he is. You already know what I believe. Why are you arguing with me? I tell 
Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 1 and 23 said, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being translated is God with us. Isaiah, I'm gonna, about to get excited, so look out. Isaiah 49, O Zion, that brings good tidings, get thee up into the high mountains. O Jerusalem, thou that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up and be not afraid. And say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God! <laughs> get up in the mountain and tell somebody. Get up somewhere where you can get some volume and tell them that Jesus is is God. Isaiah 12, 2 and 3, Behold, God is my salvation, and I will trust in Him and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. You remember when Israel was thirsty one time and they couldn't get any drink and they looked at this one well and it was kind of it wasn't where it needed to be. And God said, sing to it. Spring up, O well. Amen. And that water came forward. Amen. Jesus said, uh, He that believes on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see, salvation isn't a reservoir. Salvation is a moving river. Salvation is a spring. When you get around a Christian, you just get wet. Because they're a spring of life. When they talk about the gospel, when they share the forgiveness of God with people, it just gets people wet. It shouldn't be about, they look at you and think about your political stand. That's not what it is. It should be about this. I love what Tullian said years ago. He said, I hope one day it'll come. That when you tell people you're a Christian or an evangelical, they won't think of your political stand. But what they'll say is, is oh, you believe you're forgiven. Right. Come on, somebody give a hand clap for that. Because all that other stuff will pass away. But God's forgiveness and who Jesus is will never pass away. Isaiah, oh man, I'm, I'm feeling good right here. Isaiah 25 and 9, And thus it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited, that He might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in His salvation. Anybody believe you should be happy in your salvation? You may not be able to be happy in other things in this world, but you can be happy because Jesus has saved you. 1 Timothy 3 and 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and nothing was made without Him. In Him was life, and His life was the light of men. Praise God. Then John 1 and 14 said, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. <laughs> Amen. Isaiah 40 and 3. Can I give you some scripture here today? Amen. I love the Bible. A voice is calling. This is John the Baptist's message. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. What am I trying to tell you today? Jesus is God. And God is our Savior. And that's what we should be proclaiming. Daniel Webster, the father of the dictionary says in rhetorical fashion, Mr. Webster, somebody asked him, can you comprehend how Jesus Christ could be both God and man? He said, no, sir. I cannot comprehend it. And I would be ashamed to acknowledge him as my savior if I could comprehend it. If I could comprehend him, he could be no greater than myself. And such is my conviction of accountability to God. Such is my sense of sinfulness before him and such is my knowledge of my own incapacity to recover myself that I feel I need 
a superhuman savior. Oh, I love that. Isn't that great? I don't understand it all. I just know it's true. I can't understand. It's all right. I hope that's Jesus talking. <laughs> Who is? No, that's right. I'm just playing with you. It's all right. All right. Jesus is God. Who is Jesus? He's not only God. He's the sacrifice for our sins. I'm just. I always wait for a phone to ring so I can say that. I just love <laughs> saying it. All right. Praise God. Jesus is the sacrifice for our sins. Are you happy today? Yes. Here's John one. I love this. John the Baptist. Don't you like John the Baptist? John the Baptist is cool. John the Baptist is out there rocking some animal skins, eating honey, right? And, and locusts. And, you know, just, he's got locusts in his legs and his teeth, right? He's a tough guy. He's a man's man. Jesus said he was a man's man, by the way. Can I give you a little commentary here? When he talked about John the Baptist, he said, what, what you have to see, a man in soft raiment? It's interesting in the Greek, you know how it says it in Greek, what went you out in the wilderness to see a man that was effeminate? Oh no, he wasn't wearing soft clothes out there. He was a real man and he was preaching. And what was he preaching? Amen. When he saw Jesus, he had a message. In John 1 and 29, he said, when he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away, praise God, the sins of the world. Everybody say the world. the world. Jesus has taken away the sins of the world. He is the propitiation not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. You can tell everybody in the world they're forgiven. They need to believe it, but you can tell everybody that they're forgiven. Boy, that makes Christians mad, boy. Some Christians, they're real legalistic ones. When you, well, how can you tell people they're forgiven? I said, I've heard this before. Mm -hmm. They did that to Jesus, didn't they? Guy comes down, he's paralyzed, can't say nothing, can't sign the book, can't accept Jesus, can't kneel at the altar, right? Can't get thrown in the water yet. Come on now. And Jesus, he, he looks at him and he says, uh, son, your sins are forgiven. Who can forgive sins but God only? Now you're getting it. Praise God, right? Amen. Now you're getting it. Hallelujah. Praise God. This is whom I said. He said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven as a dove. By the way, that's the third person in the Trinity. That's the Holy Spirit, just if you didn't know. <laughs> Verse 33, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water, that's the Father, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. How about that? Praise God. And I have seen and I have bore witness that this is the Son of God. Who do men say that I am? I'm giving you the answer. Isaiah 53 says he had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't a Hollywood star. He wasn't like the guys you see play him in the movies. Huh? He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not, yet he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. But we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. And with his stripes he was healed. The beatings that he bore on his back brought us healing and forgiveness. The crushing of Jesus brought us forgiveness. You know, in the Bible, they always used bread and grain that was crushed before they made the bread. Isn't that awesome? They said the candlestick in the tabernacle had to be made of beaten gold. As God was beaten in Jesus Christ. It's a mystery, isn't it? But God did this. Why? So he, the Lord, could lay on him the iniquity of us all. The dying Jesus is the evidence of God's anger towards sin. But the living Jesus by the resurrection is the proof 
of God's love and forgiveness. The death of Jesus is the only entrance into the life that he lived. We cannot get into his life by admiring him or by saying what a beautiful life that he is. There's people that revere Jesus. They don't like Christians much, but they like Jesus. You ever met him? You mention Jesus, and they're like, oh, he's cool. Jesus is just all right with me, like the Doobie Brothers, you know. <laughs> but when you mention Christians, they're like, ah. Oh. Sometimes we bring that on ourselves, right? Come on now. We, but we can't get into his life by admiring him, saying what a beautiful person he was, and so pure and holy. To dwell in his life would only drive us to despair. It would bring us under the law. We enter into his life by means of his death, by being baptized into his death, his burial, and his resurrection, as Romans 6 says. The death of Jesus would be an insignificant thing if we didn't see it that way, right? But we are amazed the New Testament makes so much of what? When you read the Gospels, they talk more about Jesus' death and his crucifixion than anything else. Because that was the thing that redeemed mankind. Are you still here with me? Yeah. Charles Spurgeon, and I like to bring him up here. He said, true have his promises been. Not one has failed. I want none beside him. In, in life, he is my life. And in death, he shall be the death of death. In poverty, Christ is my riches. In sickness, he makes my bed. In darkness, he is my star. In brightness, he is my sin forgiver. He is the manna of the camp in the wilderness. And he shall be the new corn of the host when they come to Canaan. Jesus is to me all grace and no wrath, all truth and no falsehood. And of truth and grace, he is full, infinitely full. Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. He is God. If we go through some water in the next few days, Jesus is still your dry ground. If you lose some property, He's still your inheritance. Did you hear me, friend? Things in this life that we worry about so much will pass away. But what we have in Christ will never pass away. Come on now. Are, are you with me? Jesus is the one we concentrate on because he is God. He is our sacrifice. And I'd I like to do a little bit here. Just bear with me and tell you before we close a little bit more about Jesus. I'm preaching about Jesus today. Some of you have heard more about Jesus than most people have heard in sitting in church for two hours today. You're here right now, right? For it's in Jesus there is an acceptance that will never be questioned. In Jesus there's an access that will never be discontinued. In Jesus there's an assurance that will never be uncertain. In Jesus there is an attraction that will never be superseded. In Jesus here there is a bank that will never be closed. In Jesus, there is a beauty that will never be marred. In Jesus, there is a comfort that will never be lessened. In Jesus, there's a deliverance that will never be thwarted. In Jesus, there's a forgiveness that will never be rescinded. In Jesus, there's a glory that will never be clouded. In Jesus, there's a grace that will never be arrested. In Jesus, there's a happiness that will never bring uh, and be interrupted. Uh, and a hope uh, that will never bring despair. An inheritance that will never be alienated. In Jesus, there's an intercessor that will never be disqualified. In Jesus, there's a judgment that will never be separated. In Jesus, there's a justification that will never be reversed. In Jesus, there's a knowledge that will never be baffled. In Jesus, there's a life that will never die a love that will never be fathomed a light that will never be darkened in Jesus can I preach about Jesus in Jesus there's a, I've got my Baptist on right now a Jesus is a nature that will never be changed in Jesus there's a peace that will never be understood in Jesus there's a purity that will never be defiled in Jesus there's a portion that will never be measured in Jesus 
There's a righteousness that will never be tarnished. A rest that will never be disturbed. A resurrection that will never be denied. A revelation that will never be destroyed. In Jesus, there's a salvation that will never be invalidated. In Jesus, there's a standing that will never be unrewarded. In Jesus, there's a seal that will never be violated. In Jesus, there's a title that will never be overcast. In Jesus, there's a victor who will never be vanquished. In Jesus, there's a wealth that will never be depleted. And in Jesus, there's a wisdom that will never be confused. That's who Jesus is. Amen. He is your all and your all. And with all that's going on in the world that we hope will change, and in the governments, and in the kingdoms, and in the riots, and in everything that everybody wants change. There is truly only change in Jesus. I'm telling you, friend, after many years, and God saving me from suicide at 15 years old, I can tell you there is no more comfort than there is. In Jesus Christ, when you're living in an alcoholic home with a father like that and temper and anger all the time, I can tell you that in Jesus there is hope. Oh, how I love the church. Oh, when I first got in the church, that little assembly God church down the road, they were very kind to me. I was very down on myself, a fat kid walking into that church in a t-shirt and jeans. But when those people saw me after service, they wrapped their arms around my neck. Total strangers, Wanda, wrapped their arms around my neck. And they said, we love you. And Jesus loves you too. That saved my life hearing about that Jesus. I got in that church both feet in. I get accused of a lot of things, but I, when I get in something, I get in it both feet. They gave me a key. I, I used to clean that church, just a kid, cleaning and vacuuming the church and dusting the pews. Went out and butchered the bushes so bad, but they, they never said anything about it, amen, because they, there was a love there. There was a kindness there that they had encountered from Jesus. It was that Jesus that saved my life. It was His love. But I want to tell you this, in all the journey that I've been in, I struggled with guilt. I struggled with shame. I wondered if God had forgiven me. I stood, because, you know, you get in, they love you, and then here comes the rules. And do this, and do that. you got to pray more, and you got to fast more, and you got to do this, and you got to do that. And it lows you down with, man, I can't do this. I... I'm, I'm overwhelmed with all that it is. And I, I felt and I was trying to be holy and went to a holiness school and tried all of that, despairing of my life. But when I got cancer in, in 2015 and had to take a break from our church, I was overwhelmed with anxiety and depression. I couldn't go back to my old church. I, I took a break from the one I was pastoring. And I went to a little church in McCungee, Pennsylvania. It was a little LCMS church. I didn't even know what that meant. I know all these synods and everything, whatever that is. But the man was evangelical too. He was kind to me. And I, I had been studying a little bit about him, been listening on the radio, so I knew if I wanted to have communion, I'd come in and ask the pastor. And I walked in there, Gary, and I said, Pastor, I'd like to take communion today. And he said to me, do you believe this is the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that was shed to you for the forgiveness of your sins? I said, yes, sir. I didn't know. I, I did, but I didn't know how much. I wasn't sure yet. didn't know what I know now. But he says, you can take it. My confession was good. And I went in there. But I'm getting to this. I sat down in that pew by myself. And the pastor got up there and did what we did today. This confession stuff, I was like, oh, okay, I'm not without this. I was raised Catholic. I don't know what's all this stuff. But he quoted the scripture. I knew that was 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins. God, so I said, okay, this is cool. This is biblical. But when the pastor got up there and he, and he said, upon your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and a dame, serve the word, announce the grace of God in you, 
And then stand by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. I was overwhelmed and I sat there and wept in that service. After 30 years of going to church, I think that was the first time I heard you are forgiven. It was absolution. We came down here. I'm telling you about Jesus and what he can do. We came down here in 2016. Thought I was going to die. Fourth stage cancer. Had gone to my lung. Flooded like some of you. Went down to Mexico. Come back two days later. Flooded. You're talking about Job. But I'll tell you this. While we were going through all that, I didn't know that God was using that darkness and that dark time to get me here. So I could hear more about what I needed to hear. My friend Adam Kutz, he's a tough guy. He's Fort Wayne Seminary. They're tough. I said, what should I do, Adam? He says, go down there to Baton Rouge and get your pastor. So I did. I went to the Lutheran Church. I didn't want to go to the Lutheran Church. I don't know why I didn't want to go over there, but... The Lord, I felt like, told me to go, and I went. I got to hear the gospel. got to hear what it was like. But here we are today. We're with the unexpected because of what impacted me from these words that the pastor said, you are forgiven. That's why we call it absolution, church. Because I was absolved of my sin. And I want to give that message to everybody we can because Jesus is the absolver yes. of all sins. He died for you. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter the sin that you think that haunts you. Some of you, even a bit in church, you still have a shame and a guilt that follows you all of your life. Maybe you had a record, maybe a bad thing, maybe people are constantly reminding you of what you used to be. But Jesus does not do that. You confess your sin to him and he forgets it and casts it in the sea of forgetfulness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Jesus has forgiven you 100% completely. There's no clean slate. The slate's broken. The stone table is cracked. It doesn't exist anymore. There's no more record keeping. Jesus fulfilled the record and did it all in your behalf. Today, know that you're forgiven. Know that Jesus, the one that Peter confessed as the Son of God, was not just a doctrine, but the one that had come in flesh to die to forgive you. And if you were the only one that ever existed, he would have done it for you. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your heart and your mind. In Christ Jesus, and everyone said amen. 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 Would you bow your head and would you pray with me just a little bit today? Praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow, Lord, we sang today. We praise you, Lord, for there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Father, I pray today that just as you spoke to Peter, through your word, speak to your church today through what they have heard. That they could say that flesh and blood did reveal this to me, but my Father which is in heaven as we hear the voice of the Lord say, you are forgiven. And you have commissioned us, Lord, to be your voice to all who are out there of forgiveness. And we thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for saving people in this church from despair, from hopelessness. Help them to understand the things that they've done in their life might have caused them to go down paths they didn't want to be in. That you're still with them and you love them just like nothing had ever happened. And you comfort them when they think about it anyway. 
Praise God. So, Father, we pray today that you would bring this understanding that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, to our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Today, Lord, we want to pray for healing for Carolyn and for Susan Reagan. Lord, these requests have been brought to us today that you would bring healing in lungs and in heart, that you would remove tumors, that you would work a miracle, and that people would be astonished like they were in the Bible of the good things of God. And if, Lord, it is people's time to go to be with you, let the joy of the Lord be their strength. And even in the midst of that, help them to understand that lo, even in the valley of the shadow of death, you are with them. And you will comfort them, Lord, in your mercy. Father, today we pray for all of our brothers and sisters across the world. We pray for those, Lord, who feel downcast and unaccepted and downtrodden. You see all the stuff that's going on, Lord, in our world today. People don't feel accepted. They don't feel loved. They don't feel equal. But Lord, that only comes in Christ. And I pray, Lord, you would bring that to them through people, through your word, by your Holy Spirit. We pray for our persecuted brethren across the world that you would comfort them, whether in prison or sickness or torment, that you would be with them, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all of our churches in the area that, that preach the gospel. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would fill them, that you would use them to go out among the people and be that fountain where people can get wet with the water of forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy. And today, Lord, we want to pray for our government. We pray, Lord, for all those that are in authorities you've commanded. We pray that you would save them from the White House to the courthouse, that you would save them by your grace. Lord, in your mercy. And today, we want to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen? The peace.